word prayer. Uh, would you mind standing up and then having a word of prayer? Thank you. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful that you are here with us. So thankful that uh, we are your children. So thankful that we can worship freely and that we can come to your presence as we are and feel embraced and feel loved by you. Um, Lord, I, I don't want to listen to myself today because I already know how I sound. I really want to listen to your voice so the people that came today can listen to your message and what you have to say. So please empty myself from my prejudices, from my opinions, from my credentials, so your Holy Spirit can descend despite of me. And I also ask you humbly and in the name of Jesus, empty the space that you need in the heart, in the soul, in the mind of everybody here, all the youth and adult people, so we can listen to your voice. We love you. We want to worship you in the spirit and in truth. Teach us. We don't know how. Teach us, Lord, because we desperately come to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, my name is Adriana Pereira, and um, I'm originally from Uruguay, South America, but I came here to Spain when I was 19 uh, to serve as a missionary, and I stayed here for 18 years because I, I found a Spaniard, handsome Spaniard, and um, I stayed here for 18 years, and 10 years ago, we moved to the States to serve there. We serve at Oakwood University, which is in Alabama. It's a beautiful university, a historically black university. Gospel and jazz are awesome there. And now, a month ago, we have moved to Andrews University, and I am chairing the music department there, and um, that is why I was telling you I'll be happy to assist you in anything you need or any question you have. But today is not about me. Today is about God. And the title of the presentation is Make a Joyful Noise, and I'll tell you why. I sent a list of presentations to the organizers of this event, and they told me, okay, we know the reality in the inter-European division and also in the trans-European division, and the topic of how to use musical instruments is one of the topics that still are divisive and controversial to the church. So let us talk about that. Let's talk about how to use musical instruments for the glory of God in our local congregations or in our uh, churches. And I appreciate your silence. Thank you very much for, for your respect and silence. So when we go to the Bible, and we go especially to the New Testament, to what Jesus said about music, I want to ask you if you can remember any quote, any verse, any words in which Jesus talked about musical instruments. Can you? Anybody? By the way, there's a prize for people who answer, okay? So anybody can remember Jesus' words on music? Or musical instruments? New Testament? None of you? Why not? Because he didn't say anything. Hmm? How is that he didn't say anything over a topic that is so controversial and is so important? Well, it's not that important. Musical instruments will not save us. And musical instruments will not um, make us lose or fall out of salvation. So why are, why are we talking about musical instruments? Because we have raised this topic to such an important level that sometimes we are divided as a church in what instruments to use or what instruments are evil or if instruments are good or bad. Or if God has any favorite instruments that are more appropriate to worship or not. So. It is important to remember that the Bible in the New Testament doesn't say anything about musical instruments. Now, we have some principles that we have to um, apply to our reality, but Jesus doesn't say anything. So let's go to the Old Testament. The, the Old Testament tells us a lot more about musical instruments. We will never find a list 
If you ever hear anybody telling you there is a list of godly instruments and satanic instruments, please go to the Bible and find out because I don't have the truth, but the Bible does. Amen? So go to the Bible because you will not find a list of divine or satanic, good or bad instruments. But we find some instruments in the Bible. So let's ex let us explore a little bit that. Psalm 98, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous songs of, and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together. This is the Bible. So I, I will ask you how, many you, how many of you clap your hands in your local churches to worship? Okay, maybe 10 of you. In how many churches clapping hands to worship is not allowed or is not appropriate? Can you raise your hand? Most of you. Interesting because this is the Bible, and of course this is a metaphor, okay? This is a metaphor. Um, let the rivers clap their hands. But, but still, uh, clapping hands is an expression of worship. And I didn't bring today many verses on clapping hands because it's not a topic today. But Israel, they will clap their hands to worship God. So sometimes our own tradition becomes more relevant and more important and a, 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 a more relevant authority than the word of God itself. And that, that, is, that, that concerns me. I, I think it should concern you as well. Now, there's a, there's a second thing that calls my attention here. Bible says, make a joyful noise to the Lord. You know, I am a musician and I work with musical sound. I don't work that much with noise. I prefer sound rather than noise. Huh? And if you go to my playlist, my, my two kids, 19 and 20 years old, they always tell me, mom, you just like soft music. And they like more energetic music. Maybe I will go more for Hillsong United, and then we'll go for Free and Young. But I, I really love introspective, soft, sweet music, because I want to pray when I sing. But I understand that not everybody is like me. And this author in the Bible is not like me. He is saying, make a joyful noise to the Lord. And as a musician, I think, noise? No, I don't make noise to the Lord. I make music to the Lord. And I'm not saying that you should make noise to the Lord. What I'm saying is, the Bible mentions, make a joyful noise to the Lord. Then in my mind, I think, well, I don't think noise is led by the Holy Spirit because noise le leads to confusion. Are you with me? Okay, but well, let us go to the New Testament now. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm and it filled the house where they were sitting. Does it sound like musical sound or noise to you? One more time. Is this, this is the Holy Spirit descending and making some noise. And I, I don't feel comfortable with this because I'm a musician and I don't want noise. But here's the Bible um, telling me that the Holy Spirit, it himself, when it descended, it produced some big noise. And if we go to Revelation, you will see that when Jesus comes, there is a big noise coming from heaven. Yeah? So this, this it kind of concerns me because as a musician, I want my praise scene to make a beautiful, balanced, musical sound, not noise. So what, why does the Bible say make a joyful noise? I don't, I don't get it. But we will be answering this question during the presentation. Revelation 15, 2 and 3. Oh, before I do this. When I 
when I think about heaven and music in heaven, and I think about instruments in heaven, what instrument comes to your mind? Harp? Everybody agrees? Trumpet, okay. Who said bass, electric bass? That's so biased. Okay, I'm uh, just kidding. But yeah, harp is usually the one that comes to, to our mind. Will you say that harp is an instrument that God approves or, or is a godly instrument? Okay, you don't have to raise your hand. But will you say that harp is an instrument that belongs to the heaven field or atmosphere? Yeah? Why? Okay, we'll go to the um, Bible. It says, I saw before me what seemed to be a glass seed mixed with fire, and on it stood all the people who had been victorious over the beast and his statue and the number representing his name. They were all holding harps that God gave them. And in some version, it says, the harps of God. So some people will say, oh, harps are from God. Harps are heavenly. So harps are instruments that we can use in our churches because they are in tune with God. But the electric guitar is not. It's related to rock, so to drugs and, and promiscuous sex. So sometimes the division is there. So far, if we just get one text in the Bible, it looks like harps are from heaven and God is okay with harps. Are we together so far? I don't hear you. Yeah. Thank you. We're together. Okay, let's go to Isaiah now. Take a harp and walk the streets. You've forgotten harlot. For those ones that are not native English speakers, harlot is a synonym of prostitute. Make Sweden sing your songs so you will be remembered again. Why is Isaiah talking about a harlot playing the harp? One more time, this is a metaphor, but still the relationship is there. It is the harp being associated with prostitution. How is that? Well, if you can see that um, picture there, Egyptian uh, women in the time when Israel was in Egypt, they, they would play their harps to seduce men. So they were secret prostitutes, pagan prostitutes. And they will attract men by playing the harp. Some of them were not wearing any clothes. They were in the temple playing the harps and seducing men. So if I think about it, the association with harp and Egyptian prostitution is hard. It's, it's really bad. So if I think like God, like I think God would, I would never allow the harp to make it to the tabernacle. Are you with me? Never, because for Israel, the harp had a really bad connotation, really bad association. I mean, I don't know if you can get worse than that with an instrument. However, if you go to the tabernacle, you see that harps were the most used instrument within the tabernacle. So there is a process of redemption here. God redeems, and I praise God because he redeems people like me that comes from a very obscure past, and here I am worshiping God with you because he redeems, because he saves. And same thing he does with the harp. So the harp belonged to Egypt, idolatry, paganism, prostitution, and now the harp is used in the temple and the tabernacle of God to worship God. So is this harp good or is it bad? Is it from God or is it from the evil? We know that the harp is a musical instrument. What does it mean being an instrument? Being an instrument may, means it's an object. So if I get this piano, take this piano today, and then I just throw it to one of you, I can harm you really badly. But it's not because the piano is a bad instrument. And I don't know if this word comes from Tennessee and is a very racist person that built this piano, or maybe it came from um, Austria 
And uh, the, the person that built the, this piano was, um, is an atheist and it, it trafficked with human beings. I don't know. There's no way I can know. But I know it's an object. And I cannot give this object a moral attribute. I cannot say this is bad or this is good. Now, if I am, do you know, do you know the hymn, um, I Surrender All? Beautiful hymn, right? So can we sing just the first, the first phrase? Oh, to Jesus I surrender. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry I interrupted you. I, we don't have time to singing all by you sound beautiful so the, the first two notes if you know some theory you're interested this is mi fa or ef hmm? or if you work with numbers three four so if i'm a pianist and i come to the church and i want to worship god and i say okay i'll play an introduction if you're a pianist you know that the hymn doesn't have any intros right doesn't have any piano companies, right? If you're a guitar player, you, you just have to figure it out and decide the style of the hymn. So I don't know if I can have a, maybe a stand or something to talk and play at the same time, and that's okay, maybe I can, or any of you can help me to, to get the mic. Thank you, my friend, Mary Jose. Come here if you don't mind. And now that you're here, you will have to sing something. Ah, no. <laughs> uh, no, okay. All right. So if I take this two notes, and this Saturday I am, I am stressed. I had a really bad argument with her because she sings really well. I'm not talented. I sing badly. So I feel bad about myself. And I have to... I, I had to play. And I'm not thinking worshiping. I'm thinking I'm playing. Thank you, thank you. If I come on Saturday, appreciate your suggestion, and I am stressed out, and I have to play, and I am not thinking I am worshiping God through my piano, but I'm thinking I am performing. This is my performance, it's my time. Please put the lights on me, here I am. I will play the piano, but I, I, I don't feel good today. So I will start with these two notes, and I'll repeat these two notes. And then uh, lower. And then again. And again. And then faster. Uh, I don't think I will create a, a, an appropriate atmosphere for you to worship, right? And then I will start. Not appropriate. It's not because the piano is a bad instrument, okay? It's because the way I'm using it is not appropriate. I'm not trying to lift Jesus through my playing. I'm just stressed out and I'm expressing that. Now, if I take the same two notes, same instruments, mi, fa. Thank you very much. So we can. Great. So same instrument, but the use it creates another atmosphere. Same notes, same instrument. Is the is the way I use it. Are, are we together? However, this instrument, even though it's an electric piano, it has a plug somewhere. It's not bad because it is plugged. Are you with me? Because, no? Okay, this is a workshop, so if you want to raise your hand and talk, please raise your hand and, uh, and talk. We will use the last 10 minutes to questions and answers, but if you feel like raising your hand and talking, please feel, because this is a, this is a workshop. So this instrument is not better or worse because it is plugged in, in, into electricity. Are we together? But sometimes that happens with some instruments, like, can you think of an example? Guitar, bass, uh, violin. Uh, I have some friends, they are violin players, and if you have your 
Acoustic violin, everything is okay. But if you have an electric violin, uh, it's not appropriate to wash it. So what's the problem? It's electricity. So you guys shouldn't shave using a uh, electrical shaver, right? Um, the Bible again, and let's see what David says about musical instruments. And this is important. Why? Because of all the worshipers in the in the world of God, David is the one that composes and writes more songs. I deeply respect this author. He's an excellent songwriter, excellent poet, and he's an excellent instrumentalist. Saul will pick him. He was the best in Israel. Uh, he's a great luthier. He will build instruments. He's a, he's a great music minister. He will organize music ministry. He's a great choir conductor. He will, there's nothing musically he cannot do. Nothing. So, um, you know this psalm, don't you? Okay, so can we improvise and try to recreate an atmosphere that will be suitable to the lyrics? I'll say it again. We already have the words of the psalms, but we don't have the music. So can we try to improvise something with the lyrics that will recreate this atmosphere? Can, can we do that? Okay, so now I need Louis, the pianist that was singing. Please don't kill me. I, I know I didn't tell you anything, but can you come and play the piano? Thank you. Eloy, are you there? Do you have your guitar? Can you come and provide? Marie Jose, where are you? Come, my friend, go sing. Yes. Thank you. Now come. Okay, so this is new for them, but in the Psalms, the improvisation element was something in important as well. There are some Psalms that were, they had an improvisatory uh, character, and that happens, still happens in, in Israel music. So there is a, don't, don't look at me like that. It will be okay, I promise. Uh, the spirit will move. When we start with the Psalms, the first thing we have to do is we have to go to the original in Hebrew, but because we don't speak Hebrew, we miss it. If you go to the original in Hebrew, and I see a Hebrew professor here, uh, you see the beauty of rhythm and poetry. Rhythm and poetry. You know what that stands for? Rhythm and poetry. What is that? Rap, right? Rhythm and poetry. I'm not promoting rap, don't worry. I'm promoting David's composition, which is poetry that goes with a certain pattern, which is rhythm. So let us start with a pattern, rhythmical pattern, okay? Um, you mind? Can we do this? Okay. All right. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. Now, the, the pattern that we will use for the lyric is ta ka ta ka ta ka ta. One more time. Ta ka ta ka ta ka ta. Join this. Ta ka ta ka ta ka ta. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise Him is mighty heaven. Praise Him for His mighty works. Praise Him with the blast of the ram's horn. Praise Him with the lyre and harp. I don't hear you. Praise Him with the tambourine and dancing. Praise Him with string and flute. I don't hear you. Praise him with a clash of cymbals. Praise him with loud clash and cymbals. Let everything the breath sing praise into the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, thank you. That is. So some of you are thinking, hmm, maybe this doesn't sound like secret music. We're making a joyful noise here. We're using 
the word of God here, and we are trying to recreate the spirit of the word of God that says, sing a new song, sing a new song, sing a new song. Never says, don't sing anything that hasn't been sung before. It doesn't say, please keep singing the same song until you don't feel it anymore. Doesn't say, please don't go beyond the last cover of the hymnal book. It says, sing it new, make it fresh out of your own experience. Now, David will write the song on Wednesday and on Saturday will be sung by the people. So it was fresh, it was new. Hmm? Now, we have the pattern, ta ka ta ka ta ka I mean, it, it can be that one, it can be anything, but I really loved what the worship team did and is doing. Do, don't you think they are doing a great job in this Congress? Praise God, praise God. And what they did with the first song, I was curious, what are they going to sing? Because we're so many nations, so many languages, what are they going to sing that we all will be able to sing? And they sung a, a, a hymn that we know, do, 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 do. but instead of, they do, they just added a dot. Just added a dot, and everything changed. So what we are doing here is we are adding a dot. Instead of praise him with a lyre and harp, we're doing praise him with a lyre and harp. So we're just adding one little thing, which is a little more, little more uh, rhythm, a little more motion. I don't want to see. I don't want to say the word because it's a controversial word. But you know the word. Syncopation. Okay. There's nothing wrong with syncopation. God created us with syncopation. We, we, we blink, and we have the heart, and we are talking, and we're at the same time, and we're thinking. All of that is syncopation. It's, it's different rhythms, different displacements. Now, we have to go with the melody now. We have rhythm. Let's go with the melody now. So we need a volunteer here. Any volunteer that give me three notes, three notes, A, B, C, A, B. Okay, you, please. Uh, do me, one, two, three, A, B, C, whatever you prefer. This beautiful lady with the glasses at, at the end, yeah. D, E, G, C, E, G. You know, you know music theory, right? Uh, you know, okay, that's a major chord. Can, can you, uh, look, I know you can do that. Can you please? C, E, G, yeah, it's, okay. You know, I just, so only one chord and he's coming with a whole progression. All right. All right, so we will work with the melody uh, in Praise Him with a lyre on heart. Oh, this is the second part. Okay. Praise God in, in His sanctuary. Can we do that? Okay. And then, and then just go with the flow. Eloy is a great composer as well, great singer, great songwriter. So let us improvise here. Okay, I will follow you guys, and then you, Marie Jose, you will be singing as well. Okay, so Mike is yours. No, 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 Mike. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so let us do this together. It will be improvisation, and once you get familiar with the the, the melody that flows, we'll do it together. So we'll start with uh, rhythm. Huh? Here we go. One, two, three, and eh? and then clap too loud. Okay, intro, thank you. Okay, here you go. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heaven. Change the chord. Praise him for his mighty work. Praise him in his equal greatness. Praise him with the blast of the ram's horn. Okay, great. Very good. Thank you very much. Any anybody here wants to come and lead with a melody? Anybody? Just come and improvise. We need a volunteer really, really quick. Maricose, thank you. Alright. So we'll start from the beginning again. From the beginning again. Alright? Do you want to participate as well? Come. 
Okay, you go. We have to do this. We have like three minutes. Okay, here we go. We start with uh, the rhythm first, and then uh, they will start with the chord progression, and they will be improvising. So, what's your name? Spanish. Spanish. Naira? Ni Naira. Ni Naira. Okay, uh, welcome and thank you. So, Marie Jose, and you, you'll be improvising. Maybe you can um, start and you can follow. All right, this is risky, but this is improvising, so it's, it's good. Here you go. One more time. One, two, three, four. Okay, here you go. Do you want to start? Praise God in His sanctuary. Praising His mighty heaven. Praise Him for the mighty world. Praise Him for an echo with us. Praise Him with a life for a heart. Praise Him with the tambourine and dancing. Praise Him through the tambourine and dancing. Praise Him with the sight of water. Praise Him with a cloud of symbols. Keep it going. Praise Him with light and symbols. Let everything that breathes Sends him to the Lord Thank you very much. Okay, now we'll do this. Um, at the end, we'll do an A minor chord. A minor? Because uh, they say that here, you people, they, they use more minor. Chords. So, what well, we consider minor chords. So, at the end, we'll be singing hallelujah. We'll be singing hallelujah in harmony. And you'll be uh, speaking praise with him with a lyre and harp. Praise him. Okay, just speaking, we'll be singing. Can we do that? One, uh, can we have an MS? Just A minor the whole time. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, D major. Hallelujah, E major. Hallelujah. Ah, what is it? Hallelujah. A. F. Hallelujah. G. Hallelujah. G. E. Hallelujah. Okay, got it. One more time. Hallelujah. A. F. Hallelujah. G. Hallelujah. E. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise Him with a light on heart. Praise Him with a tambourine and dancing. Praise Him with strings and food. Praise Him with the cloud of symbols. Praise Him with love in the symbols. Praise Him. Praise to the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah! 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for our improvised phrasing. And this is something that we can do. Amen. There's so much potential in our church. There's so much talented people. This is difficult to do. They just came and did it. No rehearsal. Don't do this in your church. Rehearse first, okay? <laughs> Practice is important. But the creativity is there. So you start with the rhythm, always. I'm a composition teacher, so it's not that I, I, I'm bragging about it. It's just what I do. I sing really badly, but I, I can write music. and. Uh, I always tell my students, start with rhythm. Rhythm is, is the core of music. So you start maybe with ta-da-da, ta-da-da. Start working with rhythm. And then, of course, take into account the word. 
and then you add melody lines, and then you you add harmony, and spend time one, two, three hours in compositions will come. But the whole idea is, at the beginning we haven't used any piano, any guitar, but we were making music without any instruments. The African tradition uses a lot of body language, and the Hebrew tradition as well. So the word was more important to them than the musical instrument. And that is something that we should take into account if you're an instrument player. The word of God has to be predominant in sacred music. If we cannot hear, if we cannot understand the word of God, we cannot worship him. So if you are an instrumentalist, you are not the star. First of all, the star is Jesus Christ, amen? amen. He is the one to get the glory, to get the center, and to get all the worship. But if you're an instrumentalist, you just, to, you just have to create an atmosphere to convey the lyrics. The lyrics, we already have the best lyrics in the whole wide world, which is the word of God. This is the lyrics. We don't have the music. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not telling you, you, you cannot change the lyrics. You can, you can, you have to base your song in this lyric in the word of God, which is ultimately the Logos, which is ultimately Jesus Christ himself. He is the word, amen? Now, you have to provide a, a, an atmosphere to convey that word. And as a com composition uh, major, and as a musician, as a Christian, what I feel is that in our church, we are losing the joy. People come and uh, people come, sorry, and they don't find the joy. And the proposal of the word of God is make a joyful noise. Joyful, keep it joyful. If you count in the in the book of Psalms, how many times the Psalms talk about joy? You know how many times? Eighty times. Eighty times David, Solomon, Moses, Asaph, did it. All of them are talking about joy because Jesus is good news. It's not depression. Don't get confused between reverence and depression. They're not the same. Joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Don't forget the joy. Now, I want you to reflect on something. This is Ellen G. White. The next day, the courts of the temple were filled with worshipers. He, she's talking about Jesus dying on the cross. But never had a service been performed with such conflicting feelings. So we have the Levites in the temple worshiping. Jesus is dead, and they are worshiping as always. The trumpets and musical instruments and the voices of the singers were as loud and clear as usual, but a sense of strangeness pervaded everything. One after another inquired about the strange event that had taken place. They were doing what they were ordained to do. Sing and play the lyres and the trumpets and the cymbals. And they were doing that, but it didn't resound the same. Because the ritual didn't have the same meaning now. At the very moment that Christ had expired, the heavy veil of tapestry made of pure linen and beautiful wrought with scarlet and purple had been split from top to bottom. The place where you, Jehovah had met with the priest to communicate his glory, the place that had been God's sacred audience chamber laid open to every eye. This place was not longer recognized by the Lord here on earth. No more holy place here on earth. We know that there is a holy place, most holy place in heaven, but not here anymore. So, what did Jesus say about what's next? How are we supposed to worship now? Which musical instruments are we supposed to use now? What musical styles are we supposed to? He didn't say a thing. He just gave us some principles that we had to disclose and apply to our reality. So, this is Paul disclosing the principle, and I love this. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body. Use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. I will say it again. You are the instrument of God, so use your whole body. 
clap, use your voice, use your hands, use your feet to worship God because you are the instrument of God and use it for his glory. So sin is no longer your master for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, dear youth, Adventist youth, we live under the freedom of God's grace. Hallelujah. We live under the freedom of God's grace. I am so happy. I'm so excited. I, I'm not under the law anymore. I live by grace. And the grace of Jesus helps me to obey the law. Amen? Amen. So I'm not like, oh, I, have to, I have to sing this. I have to do this. I have to eat this. I have to dress this way. No, no. I no longer live. It's Jesus living in me. And he creates this desire to worship him and to play, not for listen or for people listen to me, but for people reaching him, meeting him with me, despite of me. Because I, as the harp, was lost. But now I see. You are the instrument. You are the instrument. Don't get it wrong. It's not about one specific musical instrument. You are the instrument of God. So instruments, they evolve. Hmm? We shouldn't be, if anybody tells you, oh, we have to use lyres and harps now because that was in the temple. Listen, if anybody tells you that, this is what you should say. Okay, if we have to use the same musical instruments that the Old Testament used under the Old Covenant, so we have to have priests using the same clothes and we have to have lambs and those sacrifices and those rituals. And what Ellen G. White just said is, it is finished. That veil was split. split. Don't re the veil. It is broken. It is a new time we are living under grace. And you know, this is what we are not understanding. It's not about the musical instrument. We put the musical instrument as the real, real deal or the real problem, but it's not. It's at the top of the iceberg. The real problem is we don't understand the grace of God. We don't live under the grace of God. We don't feel the freedom to worship Him, making a joyful noise. It's not as because of the musical instrument. It's because we don't understand the theology. Let me tell you something. Christian music expresses Christian theology. If we don't get the theology right, we will not get the music right. So don't start by the music. Start by theology. Start by your comprehension of God. I have five minutes, right? Every, all the instruments, they evolve. Um, flutes in the Bible, they were made out of bones. Now, praise God, we don't use bones anymore. We use metal. Now the flute developed in clarinet, oboe, saxophone, and so did some others. For example, today, when you think a really um, sacred instrument, the king of sacred instruments is the organ. When you go to the origin of the organ, it's in Rome. Rome will use portable hydraulic organs while they were slaughtering, killing Christians in the first and second century. So imagine you were a wife of a Christian martyr that was dying in the Roman circus, and you were listening to the organ as your husband was being killed. So for you, the organ has a pagan Roman persecution association. And now you wake up in the 21st century, and you go to a Christian church, and you see this organ. What, do you, what would you think? You, you would think, how is that the organ is a Christian instrument? If, if it is rooted in the Rome, Roman tradition, paganism, and all of that. Well, at some point, the organ didn't have the association of Rome, persecution, and paganism. At some point. But it took five centuries. Um, there is a question here. Yeah. Let me give you the mic so it can be recorded. Thank you very much. Uh, this. Thank you. If I if I understood you uh, well, your question is: Was the organ? I think something happened with this. Are you able to hear me? Okay. Thank you. Uh, was the organ um, created for Christian persecution? No, not really. 
Use the function is different. Okay, I think I, I get your question. Is there's a difference between why was okay the purpose of the instrument? Why was this instrument created? Your question should um, take us to Genesis Genesis four, in which we uh, see that the grand grandson of Cain, Jubal Cain. He created the first harps and flutes. That is what the Bible said. So the first creator on earth, because we had instruments before earth creation, Ezekiel 28, 13, uh, talks about instruments in heaven, tambourines and flutes in heaven before creation. But here on earth, you go to Genesis and Jubal Cain was the first one making instruments, constructing instruments. So if we go to the real first instrument being created, it was already evil. Because it was not able descendants, it was king descendants that built the first instruments. You know what I mean? So if we go to the very root, there is no musical instrument on earth that had a good purpose when it was created. Right? We can continue this conversation. So now we're celebrating yesterday, we, you did great, um, giving testimony money of I am a Christian and I come from the Reformation. Uh, so nailing that in front of that Catholic cathedral, interesting. So, Martin Luther is very interesting when it comes to musical instruments because for four centuries, musical instruments were forbidden in the church. I don't want to get technical. If you really want to get more information, I am selling a book in the stands, uh, and there is a lot of information there, more than 2,200 pages. You may ask yourself, is she promoting her book? Yes, I am. Uh, because I, I, I have... I am lecturing, going everywhere, and I think we need material, and we need to reflect, and we need to pray, and we need to get more information. We need to go to the Bible. That is why I wrote that book. So we are in a stand. You can get my book. Um, the prophets go to create more music ministry, by, by the way, material. So Martin Luther brings musical instruments to Christian literature after a, a thousand years, no instruments in the Christian uh, church because the, the Christian leaders Forbidden the instruments, okay? They forbid. Cre uh, Martin Luther creates the Lutheran chorale so everybody can sing because just the men could sing. And then he intentionally brings back joy to the worship experience. Huh? That is what Martin Luther does. So Christian music reflects Christian theology. This is the first official Adventist musical band that we have. It's, I, I didn't I didn't take the picture. I promise I was not born in 1895, not yet. I may look like I'm not that old. But yeah, this was the official band. LNG White uh, approved this band. She approved this band. They they play for the, the general conference in 1901. Um, it's interesting because um, you don't see any Latino, you don't see any black, you don't see any Asian, because this is the first generation of Adventists, Anglo-Saxon. And what was really making a blast in the Anglo-Saxon culture was William Booth and Salvation Army. So William, um, Ellen G. White said, this is working, this is reaching people. William Booth grew exponentially in 50 years, more than 80,000 Christian converted to Christ because of Salvation Army and the way they were reaching people. So Henry White and James White, they were like, this is working, let us import this model to the Adventist movement. That is why they look exactly like a Salvation Army band. And this is 19th century. I wonder if this official ensemble, Adventist ensemble, go to your church today, I wonder if they could play. And I'm not trying to be sarcastic. I am sad about this because I don't see in many places, I don't see a progression, but a regression. I don't see us as a movement creating material, 
and giving you the opportunity to record and we support your musical ministry and we are there uh, hand by hand providing information and material and training but usually what we do is we tell you what's wrong but the alternative we usually don't provide so we want that to change i want you to know the adventist church want this to change and we are trying to create material we are trying to move in another direction so the process of change if you are in your church and you play the violin or the flute or the guitar even the electric guitar or even the drums and you don't find a space and it's difficult take into consideration there is a process of change the organ didn't make it to the church in one year it took it 500 years don't worry now the process of change is a little faster it's usually 10 to 15 years i'll say it again it's 10 to 15 years this is reality so this is a process let's say that i say um can we can we buy an electric piano and people in in, in my local congregation will say well we're not sure and there, there will be conflict that's the second step um, we're not sure why not a piano. Well, piano was related to the bar. Piano bar, does it sound familiar to you? Not flute bar, but piano bar. So that, that's the origin of the piano in Europe. So be careful, maybe the piano can bring people, you know, drunk people to the church or create a secular atmosphere. We don't want to do that. So it will be conflict. But at the end, the team will say, you know what, let us give the piano a chance. This is what happened with the piano in the 19th century. Nobody wanted this instrument. Now it looks so Christian, but it was not that Christian in the 19th century. Huh? We, we got baptized, right? <laughs> so uh, in, the third, in the third stage, we will have rejection and acceptance. In the first church, it was in Vienna, that a pastor said, we will use a piano. Half of the congregation left because they, they thought the piano was not Christian, it was not appropriate. So there was a, a case of rejection, but in case of accept, acceptance, this instrument becomes traditional. So for my kids, they grow up in the church, they see the piano, piano is okay, piano is Christian, but now we start with another instrument, the violin, oh, I don't see the violin, the flute, oh, I don't see the, the saxophone, oh, the saxophone saxophones they have a lot of problems and i'm sorry about saxophonists just keep trying it's a great instrument uh, but so we will finish with five ideas to make a joyful noise in your local church five ideas and i'll leave you we'll have five minutes uh, for for questions and answers first of all keep jesus at the center what we are doing here is sacred music this is not about us it's not about our music it's about Jesus. If you study in a conservatory or a music school, they will teach you how to be a great performer. But when you come to the church, it's not about your performance. It's about God's performance. It's about what he did. It's about who he is. So remember, worship doesn't mean to play music. Worship means to bow down before God and to say, I am nothing and you're everything. I'm nobody and you're my creator. I'm the creature, you are eternal. That is worship, that is to worship. So remember everything you do, keep Jesus at the center. If you wanna start with an instrument band, instrumental band, please remember to start by praying at least 30 minutes, at least. Pray that the Holy Spirit descend because you wanna worship in spirit and in truth. Not with your technique, not with your skills and your modes and your spell. nothing wrong about it. But it's not about that. It's about Jesus in the center, at the center of everything you do. So remember, if you want to make music first, the word of God has to dwell in your heart, and then you will make music. Second, the words have to be predominant. If we are playing our musical instruments and nobody can hear the lyrics, it's wrong. We have lost our direction and our purpose. It is better, LNG Y said, it is better not to use musical instruments if you don't know how to use them. It makes sense, right? If you don't know how to use it, don't use them. Just sing a cappella. But the word has to be predominant. We musicians, we instrumentalists, we get so excited about what you can do with our musical instruments that we just forget that it's not about the music. It's just a means. 
Let the word of God dwell in your heart through music. It's not the music that has to dwell in your heart. It's the word of God through music. Music is a mean. Number three, do your best to reach everyone. It's not about what I like. Oh, I like this style. I don't like that style. So see what Paul says. When I am with those who are weak, I share their weakness, for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to say some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. Huh? If you're a drummer, if you study percussion, and in your church there is a rejection, and the church, the congregation is not ready to implement percussion, please don't press, don't force, don't impose. You want to be a blessing. So try to work with the board. Try to work with the pastor. Find a way. Maybe you can use some kind of percussion in a youth meeting and see the reaction of people. If it is negative, I am so sorry. But it means it's not the time. But if you bring the percussion and you are happy because I am playing my instrument, but people are distracted and, and, that, and they are divided, what's the benefit? It's not about you. Hmm? We are a community. You can play your instrument six days and a half a week. But when we worship together, we have to take into account my brother and my sister because it's not about me. It's about the community. And we have to try to reach everyone. When we are, I'll, get, I'll be with you in a minute. When we present the gospel as a rock concert or any secular concert, there's no difference in the light, the smoke, the instrument, the clothing. There's something wrong because we have a distinctive message. And when Jesus talked, people said, huh, who is this man? He speaks with authority. He's not like this everybody else. He says something different. Not just what he says, but the way he says it. So we should be distinctive. If we are getting so postmodern and so uh, cool that we look like everybody else, so we are not the salt anymore. We are not the light anymore. Everything is dim, ambiguous, and we are tired of being ambiguous. We want to be relevant. So please pray in your local church to be distinctive because we have a distinctive message. Because when God is present, there has to be a difference. Because when the Holy Spirit is sent, there has to be a difference. We cannot be like everybody else. Uh, the, we had two questions here. Um, I don't know if we can use the mic. I have like two or three more minutes. So uh, this young gentleman here and then Louis. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Can I use this mic? Is that possible? Well, let's see. Okay, thank you. All right, so there's a question here. Yes, sir, that's uh, for number three. Yes. And I'm afraid that some, sometimes when we want to raise everyone, we look so on. You know what I mean? Yes, of course, yeah. I do. So there's a, there's a question there. And secondly, uh, you mentioned Vienna. Uh, in this church, and you know, we, we are almost always trying to, well, not to be the to, to come down and so on, but uh, on the other hand, what, what happened in Vienna years ago probably is a blessing for our for churches because we have organs, for example. And yes. you know, it's, you know, it's very hard to find a. It is. You know, it is. Thank you for your intervention. It, I'm not saying it's easy. I think nobody said it was easy. Um, this is difficult, but it's our responsibility and it's our challenge. We cannot just look somewhere else. We have to face this and we have to find solutions. And yes, the solution is not a global solution. Each congregation has its own dynamics and we have to be mind, mindful and sensitive of the cultural dynamics of each congregation. I've been worshiping at Oakwood University with my African-American brothers and sisters and the way they worship is, is very expressive. They use their body language. I come from a Latino um, background and I am just stiff when I worship. 
Now I'm a little more expressive because they have taught me that it's not about what people think about me, it's, it's what God feels about me and thinks about me, you know? So we have to be open to learn and to grow and we cannot apply the same formula to everybody. Completely with you. Louis, you had a question. Do you have the mic? Okay, is it a problem if we play in secular events? Can we play at church on Saturday morning? Why are you playing in a secular place? Because uh, I don't want it. Okay. I understand, yeah, I'm a musician, I understand. The week, uh, everybody has told me, yes, uh, we need to play music for like a kind of God or whatever. Uh-huh. Because it's a cocktail. Yes. And then I get money. Yeah. Just to pay food, because the church don't pay food. Uh, I know. They don't pay your instruments. We don't pay. If you go to a Sunday church, they pay. Yes, but the church, they don't pay. I understand. You have to do your own job. I understand. I would, I would answer you with the word of God. 1 Corinthians 10 through 1. Everything you do, do it for the glory of God. Okay, I, I do. Yeah, I'm not judging you. No, I don't think the, the, the truth, uh, what we need is uh, to talk not very uh, engaged with that. Yes. That's why a lot of ministers need to go to the to serve it. Yes, the that's reality. That is reality. I know. So you want to improve the instrument, but there is a point you need to um, you need to do some more to do it, yeah. Yes. And your question is, is that right? Well, there are many ways to give God the glory. Give God the glory means reflect Jesus in everything you do. So you can reflect Jesus playing secular music? Oh yes, I think so. Of course, you can be a light playing secular music? Yes, you can. Um, we are in, in the church, musicians, Adventist musicians, we are a movement trying to create awareness and to raise awareness of the fact that musicians, they need to be paid because in the Bible, the Levites in the Old Testament, they were full-time musicians and they got their tithes and offerings from the church, which was Israel, okay? So we, we have few musicians getting paid by the church, but that's the direction we are heading to because there are many other congregations that denominations that they are doing that and they are so ahead of us. Your parents paid for the music school for uh, 15 euros per hour, no, 20 euros per hour. Per hour? They yeah. Yes, we're, yeah. Um, Louis, please see me after this workshop because I have some information for you and uh, I don't have time now. I will finish the presentation and then I will um, answer questions, but I don't want you guys to be late to the next presentation. So I will finish this in two minutes and then I will stay here for five more minutes. Is that all right to answer? Uh, in this, what I meant by this was um, we need to be dissentive. I think we made a point. The sound person. If you have amplified instruments, you need to have a sound technician. Now the question is, who trains the sound technician? Do we have anybody training technicians? Uh, usually we don't. So we are making an effort. Here in Spain, there is a professional recording studio and they train sound engineers. In Germany, they train sound engineers. In Brazil, the church trains sound engineers. In the States, some churches, they train sound engineers. So this is the, the tendency now. That sound engineer is so important that they need training. So that's so relevant. Last one, keep it balanced. Remember, balance is an important ingredient in music. So rhythm, melody, lyrics, instrumentation, it has to be balanced. Um, and the last one. Andrews University, I'm not promoting the university now, I'm promoting what we are doing, which is if you have a song, if you have a poem, and you, if you want it to be published, we have an Adventist publishing house, which is Adventist Worship Music. 
Uh, so get in contact with me, write me or email me to apereda at andrews.edu and I'll be happy to provide more information. If you're interested in music ministry, we have a master's in music ministry. It will be open in Europe soon, one or two years, and you will be able to study a master's in music ministry here in the Trans-European Division and in the um, Inter-European Division.